have dreams. It's what has brought us, it's what has brought us all here today to Harassus, 600 leaders gathering together to discuss inspiring our future. And there are a few terms in the global lexicon which strike more emotion from people all around the world than the American dream. Those three simple words and the vision behind it also underwrite US policy and impact foreign policy. So we could not have a more pertinent topic to discuss tonight in these very fast changing times. I was reflecting on it on my flight here to Portugal when I picked up the in-flight magazine and I found an interview with one of America's icons, Meryl Streep. We have a screen icon here with a record 21 Oscar nominations, who Trump famously called overrated. She was asked, what fires up the activist in you? Her answer, I'm not brave at all. I just get incensed. Everybody is affected more by their emotional reaction to things than by their rationality. Our rational lives lead us to think about questions of policy and how certain ideals are being trampled on. But it's the emotional thing that moves you. I love it when Meryl Streep takes my lines. So tonight we're going to discuss policy and populism and the dream at the heart of it. What is the American dream today and where is the US heading? I'm Wendy Dent. I'm a journalist who spent most of the last seven years in the US. I investigated Trump Russia scoops on Kushner and Kasowitz, Trump's lawyer, published by Guardian US. I'm honored to be here today, by, to be joined here by two US senators, Republican and Democrat, and I'm wearing shades of red and blue in their honor, so I can't be accused of bias. <laughs> we have here Senator War and Senator Brown. Senator War is a Maryland state senator. Senator Brown is a United States senator for the District of Columbia. And we couldn't get more polar opposites in their backgrounds as well. Senator War is a former Marine. And Senator Brown is a self-described hippie from New Jersey <laughs> who went into business founding his own company. So to get started, I'd really like to know from both of you, what is your personal dream, the American dream? What does it mean to you? Uh, we have a Republican administration, so we'll start with the status quo. <laughs> Senator War. Well, thank you, Wendy, and uh, thank you all uh, for being here today, and it's a great honor for me to, uh, to join you. Um, so the American dream is freedom, in a word, and the basis of that, the root of it, is freedom of religion, and that was born in St. Mary's, Maryland, which I am proud to represent. It was back in 1634 when the colony was founded, uh, Governor Calvert gave it as his gift to the new colony, and the state of Maryland passed it along eventually to the nation of America, which has in turn shared this concept with the world. So if today you can practice your religion freely, you owe a debt to the United States, the first country to put that into its law and into its constitution. If you can't practice your religion freely today, or if you live in fear because of the God that you worship, then you should consider moving to America. There is no greater freedom, there is no greater place that you're going to be allowed to practice whatever your religion in whatever your manner. So, when, when I think about what the, the American dream or what embodies it, um, I just wanna read you. This is the, the First Amendment to our Constitution. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble or to petition the government for redress of a grievance. 
So that's, that's the heart of it. America is the land of the free. And it's embodied in our Constitution in the first words, we the people. So we the people have created our government. We the people have limited our government. And power flows from the people to our government, not the other way around. It is, it is very common in the rest of the world. So that's what, that's what, to me, embodies the American dream. And you know, when you consider the other 18 explicitly listed rights and freedoms in the Bill of Rights, we are truly unique in the world. And as long as we continue to protect those rights, the American dream will persist forever. Uh, first of all, let me say it's also, I think this has been a great con uh, conference, and I'd like to thank Frank for inviting us. This is really a wonderful idea. And uh, I don't disagree with my colleague here. Uh, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to share the stage with a veteran. Um, and, and I would just add a few things. I think the American dream is also, it's certainly about freedom, but it's also about equality, and it's also about the right of individuals to become whatever they can become without restriction. I think it's most eloquently expressed by Thomas Jefferson when he says, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, to be self-evident that we're all created equal, that we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We, to protect these rights, to ensure these rights, men make governments, and the purpose of those governments is to protect these rights, and the power to do that flows directly from the people. The power of just government flows from the consent of the governed. That was Jefferson's idea of the dream, and I think that's still the dream. And imagine what a radical idea that was in, in 1776 to say not only that we don't believe that power comes from the top down, but actually comes from the bottom up, and that you give your franchise, the power is given you by God, and you give your franchise to your elected officials, and their sole purpose is to protect your rights. And that's why you extend your, your power to those people. And that was an amazing, amazing uh, thing to say in 1776, and it still holds true today. We feel in the United States that our politicians work for us. We don't we, you know, we don't take orders from them, they take orders from us. And that is a revolutionary idea. And let me just tell you what it's meant in my life, personally. Uh, I was orphaned at the age of 15. I acted out terribly, dropped out of high school, had no future. But I was redeemed by a sister who wouldn't let me fail. And I went back to school, got an equivalency diploma, ended up actually in Maryland at the University of Maryland, got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, started my own company, became wealthy, and got, ex got elected as a United States senator. I can't imagine another country where that would have been possible. And that's what the American dream is, that you can be anything that you can be as long as it's your hard work and talent and, and, and our job as elected officials is to keep the barriers out of the way so that we all have an opportunity to be the best that we can be. And that's the American dream, and I think it's still alive and healthy. But even as a senator, you were telling me that you don't actually have a voting right? Yes, I don't have a vote in Congress because when the, the country was founded, the framers didn't understand what the power of the people would really be. So they didn't let women vote. They didn't let African Americans vote. They didn't let Native Americans vote. And they decided that the people of the nation's capital should not have a vote either because they needed to be in control of their own jurisdiction. And again, I would turn to the words of the founders when they say, we the people in order to form a more perfect union. The Constitution of the United States starts that way. And the reason it starts that way is it's an acknowledgement that our union will never be perfect. But what we need to do is we need to strive to make it perfect. 
and we have a system that allows us to do that. So that's what I try to do every day, is I try to form a more perfect union by enfranchising the 700,000 people that I represent. And it'll never be perfect, but someday we'll, we'll get there. I truly believe that. So you mentioned the famous words of the American dream. I want to ask you a question. Is the American dream now life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and an apartment on Trump Tower? Is wealth now a part of it that wasn't before? Because this is what I'm hearing is the perception from people that it is now also about wealth. I, I think pursuit of, uh, pursuit of happiness can mean different things to different people. But the, the root of America is, is an unlimited opportunity. So people, people come and immigrate to the United States, and they sell everything. They give up everything. They give up their family. They give up their friends. They give up um, you know, uh, all of their belongings to, uh, to get on a boat and to make it to the United States. And it's you know, been like that for hundreds of years. And it's because they have the opportunity to come and make anything of themselves. And many people have, have been able to make themselves quite wealthy as a result. So I think that's always been a, a part of the fabric is, is that there's no upper limit. There's no, there's no caste system. There's no barriers to uh, mobility. And uh, I mean, how many people have we met here at the conference who say, hey, I started out driving a taxi and now I'm you know, a multimillionaire running six companies? And it's because you have unlimited opportunity. Yeah, and I have to agree with that. I said, how many Horatio Alger stories are there out there? How many people came to America with nothing and, and, and made it the Rockefellers, the Robert Barons, the, the, even today, people like Bill Gates and, and Mark Zuckerberg, they were from middle class families. They weren't, they weren't landed gentry. They weren't people that were born with silver spoons in their mouth. It, the gap in America, the wealth gap is growing and we need to deal with that. But I think that's different than the American dream. I think that I stand here as a high school dropout with no parents, no prospects, as somebody that's made it as living proof that the American dream still exists. It doesn't matter what your birthright is. You know, isn't this what Dr. King said to us and when he had his dream? He said, I have a dream deeply rooted in the American dream that someday my children, my four small children, will live in a nation where they're no longer judged by the color of their skin, but they're judged by the content of their character. And that's what we do, that's what we do in America. That's what's happened in America. So many rights have been expanded just in my lifetime. You know, you look at when I was in college, women were found, 75% of all women were found in four professions. They were either secretaries, uh, nurses, teachers, or domestic workers. Now they're found in all 153 professions that are listed by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. In addition to that, uh, there are more women that graduate from law school in Washington, D.C. than there are men. This has been a great expansion of rights, and we've seen things like marriage equality and, and anti-discrimination laws that have come in and they've expanded the dream for so many people. The gap is growing, but yeah. the dream is still alive. And, 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 still I, and I think that's actually very important is, is that, um, first off, I think both of our stories are exemplars of what it is to be an American, you know? Um, I was the first person in my family to go from high school into college. And, you know, I, I got my start effectively by joining the Navy when I turned 17 years old. There's no upper limit. There's, there's no stop uh, for anyone. We can all make it. But there's, there's so much more to a nation where we, America is, is unique in one particular way that I've always found interesting is that we are relentlessly and ruthlessly self-critical. No one is harsher on Americans than Americans. We are always finding fault with ourselves and always trying to make ourselves better. Okay, but you had an election where you have now resulted in unprecedented division and I want to ask, are there really two American dreams? Because we're hearing so much about the coastal elite and the heartland being so opposed. Uh, I mean, what do you think about that? Has the dream shifted? Is this just a blip in time uh, where there's protests like March for Our Lives? Or is this saying something that people are actually really unhappy? They don't have this rosy future that you're talking about. And 
there isn't unity? Well, I, I think those are two separate things. Dreams are never based in reality. Dreams are always what can be, not what is. So the dream hasn't changed. The, the things that you talk about really come out of a fear that, that, that people have about the changes that have happened in America in pursuit of the dream. But I don't think that, that, that anything's changed. I think that when you want to build a wall around the dream, you kill the dream. So I'm against that sort of thing. But I think that, that the reality never fits what the dream is, right? If, if, we, if we deal with reality, that's one thing. But the dream is always about what can be. It's about a better life. That's why immigrants came to, to America. They came to make a better future for themselves and more important, for their children. You know, we say that again in the Constitution to secure for us and our posterity. Yeah, and, and actually, this is, uh, this is something that I talk about uh, a great deal is, is most people don't understand how much we all agree on, is that even within the Maryland State Senate, so there's 47 of us, and I would consider myself at one end of the spectrum, and I have very good friends uh, who are on the very far end of the spectrum, but we agree on almost everything. Out of, in this last session, we had 3,000 bills were introduced. We passed 900 bills. I think we had nine fights. To, to only be disputing 1% of the issues uh, is extraordinary. The amount of consensus is incredible. 85% of our bills are passed unanimously. The amount of things that we agree on vastly outweighs the differences. But the problem is, is that uh, getting elected and uh, you know, having, having the, uh, the, the majority matters so greatly that people spend a great deal of time and effort out trying to gin up uh, the, the opposition. And so, unfortunately, we spend a lot of time uh, focusing on the differences as opposed to the, uh, the commonalities. Well, yeah, the and, voters and, didn't and seem to... let me just add, I'm sorry, I don't mean oh, to interrupt, mm -hmm. but we have an adversarial system. I mean, it's based on us uh, having, having conflict, just like our economy is. It's an adversarial system. Uh, I don't think the world would be a better place or America would be a better place if every politician in America was a Democrat any more than if every politician was a Republican. We need each other and we need that conflict and we need the exchange of ideas in order to grow and keep the dream alive. And the, and the healthiest parts of our democracy are where there are two vibrant parties that have a, a sufficient voice that you don't have you know, a runaway in one direction or the other. All right. But... A lot of people have criticized the Democrats, saying that Hillary failed to represent the dreams of the heartland. Would you agree with that? And at the same time as well, Trump was saying that he represented the battlers, that he was against Wall Street, and now we saw him turning up at Davos in January. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a lot of people would say that the politicians are not actually helping the people achieve their American dream. Well, uh, again, I would just say that uh, if you're disenchanted with the candidate, uh, again, that's more about uh, what you want than, it's a, than it is about the dream. I think most Americans agree on the basic principles that get us to the dream. They just disagree on, on what those principles mean sometimes. So if you take an issue like gun control, for example, there are those of us that believe that the Second Amendment gives you the right to possess a firearm, but it's very limited. There are other people that believe that freedom is ensconced in, in, in allowing you to have any kind of firearm you want. So that's a difference of, of agreement on how the dream actually is actualized. But, but I don't think it's a difference of agreement on the basic principles of the dream, the equality, freedom, justice. I think those things are still intact. And I think, you know, I've got to tell you, as an elected official, nothing succeeds like success. And, and when your candidate loses, you always have a reason to blame them, always. Okay, but you have right now a Democrat party, you know, a year and a half after the election, and we still don't know who is really the leader. I mean, we hear more about Mueller than we but that's, do about but that's any typical, leader party. That's typical always of any party that's out of power. If you go back and you look at the United States in, say, 2009, right after uh, President Obama had been elected, you had a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate. Republicans were in the minority, basically had no voice. In fact, they were a micro-minority in the U.S. Senate. So 
you know, who was in charge. And it was, it was very difficult to put your finger on anyone and say that this is the leader of the, of the Republican Party. Because whoever has the presidency, they have a defined leader, and then that person is, is kind of calling the, uh, the tempo for the dance for the rest of the party. That right now, so that's where the Democrats are. It's hard to say where it's going to end up, you know, in, in a few months when we have another election. And, and, you know, I must tell you that I've been through this many times. I work for people like Jimmy Carter and Walter Mondale and Dukakis. Do, do any of you even remember these people? And we've been rudderless before. And we need to, a, a leader will emerge through the party system. But uh, right now, you're right. There is no leader in the Democratic okay. Party. I yeah, didn't and, expect and you both Clinton, to be agreeing with each well, other. Well, so. no, no, no. no. And, and, well, but see, this is, this is the great myth of American politics. You know, we, we really don't stand around and throw chairs at each other all the time. It just it looks that way on the news. But the, 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 problem, uh, the problem with Hillary Clinton was she was just, I mean, in my opinion, she was just an awful candidate. As, as political candidates go, she, she just wasn't able to do the job. She wasn't able to crystallize the Democratic Party behind her vision. She didn't, she didn't articulate a clear vision for here's what the Democratic Party is about. So it made it hard uh, for her to win, but moreover, she didn't leave anything of a legacy. So the Democratic Party is still searching for that. That will emerge, I believe, in the next year or two as we see stronger voices in the Democratic Party emerge as they're getting ready for the presidential election. But you know, President Trump is going to continue to uh, be the loudest voice uh, on the other side. And with the, uh, the bully pulpit, he's going to have a, a big voice for a long while. OK. Well, well we... this is something that I do disagree with, uh, my distinguished colleague. I think that America wanted to sucker punch the government. I think that they said, We're, you're, you're, you're in gridlock. You're, you're, um, uh, you know, we're not getting the country moving. We're not getting what we want out of our elected officials. And Donald Trump was somebody that was outside the system. And he saw that he had potential and, and America agreed with them. They said, you know what? Maybe we don't like this guy. I don't know. But he's not the same old, same old. And Hillary Clinton is the same old, same old. She's an insider. She's already been in the White House. We know who she is. And we're not satisfied. And we're going to tell you that we're not satisfied by sending somebody to Washington who's not a politician, who's not an insider. We want to change the game. And, and see, that's, that's what but they that's, did. that's exactly about the rise of populism. So what is yes. populism? Yes. Populism happens as the political parties polarize and pull apart, searching for newer and greater activism. And as they do that, they leave this great body of people in the center lane yeah. apart, and they forget them. And as that happens, now you create the opportunity for a transformative figure like Trump to come in and say, a pox on both of you guys. I'm going to do something completely different and stick to the middle in here, and you know, voila, he wins. It was, it was truly astonishing to watch him just walk down the Republican primary process and wipe out Every, every Republican that had any stature in the party, just one after the other after the other. It was extraordinary. Right, right. and that's something and, but that's that I think is really important is that, you know, even people in the Republican Party didn't support this man at first. And just let me say, I would really like to say something horrible about Senator Waugh, but I happen to like him. So I, I, I don't <laughs> we know can like each that. other and disagree. That's you know? okay. So, I'll, I'll try to think of something. Well, but. I'm glad that you've raised populism because that's of huge concern, especially here in Europe. So what is the red line between populism and fascism? So fascism, I, I don't know. I, Senator well, Brown might I, have I would it. just say, you know, if you're asking me that question, I would say it's the dream. We agree on the dream. We just don't agree how to get there. It's the idea that we should all be equal, that we should have liberty, that our freedom should be uh, protected. As Senator Watt said, that you should be able to pray to any God you want to, that you should be able to uh, go as far as your talent and your hard work take you. I think that's what we agree on, and I don't think fascists agree on that. I think fascists say, this is the way you do it, and if you de deviate from that, then we do don't want you. Do you think that Trump has crossed any lines there into fascism? I would not call the president a fascist. I would say that, that 
uh, he's, you know, as a Democrat, I think he's crossed some lines, yes, but. So tell me about that, because, I mean, Madeleine Albright had an op-ed where she was writing about the preconditions of fascism, and I know there were some of those. Well, I would just say a clear, clear example of that is with the Dreamers. We have a group of people, and I don't know that the audience knows about these people, but there are people that have been brought to the United States by their parents, and they were up here as children, and they grew up in the American system. And I think that there is part of uh, there is much a part of the fabric of America and the American dream is anybody. In fact, they are the people that keep the dream alive. People that we are a population of immigrants. So I think when you talk about removing those people from our society, yes, you're crossing a line. Border, sec border security is one thing, but taking people that are really Americans and sending them away because you want to. Uh, uh, satisfy people that, that think that there are people sneaking into our country and taking our jobs, I think that's crossing the line, yes. So, reading up on fascism a little bit, the, you know, the, the places that have experimented with uh, fascism, Italy, Spain, Germany, fascism is a creation of the left. And, you know, as I recall, the, the name of the party was actually the National Socialist Workers' Party. So that's not something that you would find on a conservative Republican banner anywhere. And if you were to look at the, the basic tenets, and in fact the original 25 points of the Nazi party, uh, you would find a great deal in common with the, uh, the current democratic socialists or the socialist party, the communists or uh, this delightfully named group, they like to call themselves Antifa. They share all of those things in common. So uh, those are the people that I would worry about. But the the, the question about immigration in the United States, the United States is built on immigration. Everybody in the country yes. moved there. You either walked there 10,000 years ago, or you sailed there on a boat, or you showed up in a plane. You've all immigrated there, and that's what makes America different, is, is that the people that are in America basically decided to go there, with, with an exception of about uh, six million slaves that were brought to our country. So. It's, it is a different mentality, and we absolutely have to have uh, immigration and vital immigration. And I just, this is one of my great disappointments right now of the, the current Congress is that they haven't been able to figure out a, a serious comprehensive immigration reform. Because the truth of the matter is, is that we have, I think it's 11 million illegal immigrants in the country right now. They're not going to leave, and no one in their right mind is going to try to ship them out of the country. So they're going to stay. We have to find a way to legalize it, give them permanent residency, and put them on a path, and then do that inside of a framework where we can still control our borders. So you oppose the travel ban and also the, the detention so, from ICE? So the, the question of the travel ban is, is uh, actually, it's in a law that President Obama signed that gives the president certain authorities to restrict travel from certain countries depending upon threat conditions. That's, that's what the whole travel ban is about. And uh, it's certainly not a, a global ban, it's a selected ban, and it's going through, working its way through the courts. I think it's fixing to be upheld again by the Supreme Court here shortly. So that's just, that's ordinary immigration regulation, I think. Well, Senator Brown will probably disagree. I, I think, first of all, I, I've got to say, as a Hillary Clinton superdelegate, I don't think it's fair to compare it to the Nazis. So, uh, you know, I don't really think that, that fascism is a left-wing idea. I think it's, it's people that don't believe in freedom and liberty and dissenting opinions. And, and I will say about the President of the United States, he said some horrible things about uh, immigrants. He said terrible things about Mexicans. He said terrible things. He, he said terrible things about people that live in countries that 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 uh, 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 where skin is darker than than uh, mine. You know, he said that he's called them shitholes. I mean, I mean, it's it's horrible. It's unbecoming a president to say things like that. But I don't think Americans really feel that way. I think that this has always been a political ploy, ploy that people have used since the beginning of time to gin up support for the ideas that uh, it's not, you're not the problem, it, the problem is somebody else. Yeah, and we've seen a lot of rhetoric. Instead of people calling each other the opposition, they become enemies. I mean, these right. are all very worrying symbols, and we did have Bono uh, 
showing the Statue of Liberty and saying, blessed be the shithole countries, making these really important points. Um, I know Charlottesville really concerned you. Do you want to address that for a moment there then? Well, you know, it's a horrible thing to stand there and not condemn the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, they're obvious racists and, and you know, it's hard. Look, I'm a politician. It's hard when a woman stands up with a baby and says, what do you believe about right to life? I believe a woman has the right to choose, but it's hard to say that sometimes but you have to say it, you know, it's hard. You know how she feels when she asks that question. And, and it's, you know, there's certainly a racist element that's still alive and well in America. We saw a lot of criticism of President Obama, not only on the basis that he didn't do the right thing in certain circumstances, but also on the basis that he was an African American. So racism is still alive and it's a problem in America. It's not a problem that we can't solve and it's not a problem that we haven't made great strides on. But I think that you have to be, it, it's so basic to human dignity, I think that you really have to stand up in situations like Charlottesville and say, yes, the people, the, there weren't good people on both sides. There were only good people on one side. So do you feel Trump crossed the line there by not actually standing, standing up and saying this so is So actually wrong? I, would, uh, I would argue, having actually listened to the President's comments, is that he was very explicit and very firm and very forceful about condemning the people who Hang were on, there. he changed his mind and said different things. No, 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 no. He, he added to his comments, but he was very explicit about it and it was, it was a very direct condemnation. And let me, let me tell you, we've, you know, we've had very big concerns about this in the state of Maryland, and in fact, we had, uh, we had a statue of a Supreme Court justice uh, that wrote the Dred Scott decision in 1857 that continued uh, slavery for some years and led directly to the Civil War. And so that became a huge, huge problem for our state. And in fact, in the state of Maryland, we just, we just changed our uh, state song because of its Civil War roots. So this is something that uh, is, I think, present through in, in many places, and we're trying to deal with it as best as we can. What happened in Charlotte was is you had 300 white nationalists that collected and did their very best to uh, try to create a riot, and they were finally successful. What most folks don't know is that they had actually been there a month prior and done the same thing, and they were unsuccessful. So they came back, and they were even more provocative. They were trying to create that. Uh, that event and they were trying to create that violence and unfortunately they were successful. But they were ultimately condemned and they should be condemned and roundly condemned. And, and let me tell you another problem that we have as Democrats, just to be honest with you, and I'll use another example from Maryland. Uh, there's a, a place in Bladensburg, Maryland, where they have a, a cross. It's called the Peace Cross. And it was put there in recognition of veterans who served and died during the First World War. Well, that cross is now being removed because it was on government property, okay? And there's separation between church and state. But that bothers a lot of Americans. We value veterans. We value people that stand up for their country. So this is a problem we have as Democrats that we, you know, when you talk about the heartland, that, that, that we don't realize that there are people out there saying, look, this is wrong. Why was it right for 100 years to have this cross there, and now it's, now it's not right anymore? Well, it and it's, it's, the whole world, it's, yes. it's, it's things like that that create tension inside, yes. of, the, inside of the country and between, uh, between the sides, because uh, some folks are uh, you know, very committed to you know, what we would call con uh, traditional American values, and, and some are not. And uh, there's certainly a vigorous uh, atheism movement in the United States that's trying to push out symbols of, uh, symbols of religion, uh, even though that's kind of the basis of the country. The world well, has you know looked what? to the US I, though, for leadership on all of this, so I wonder, okay. if, yeah, please you know, add to this, but also I would like to ask, I mean, does America care what the rest of the world thinks and what the West, rest of the world dreams? I mean, we now have people talking about the Chinese dream because people have felt that America has slipped from leadership including on these issues. Maybe you want to build in your comment. To <laughs> well, I would just say that the dream of America is the dream of the world. We've, that's why we've attracted people from all over the world. The, the right to be free and to uh, be 
all, all, I hate to steal the Marine slogan, to be all you can be, you know, is, is, is the dream of the world. And I think that uh, when they talk about the Chinese dream, they're talking about economic power. They're not talking about, about an ideology that makes people equal. Look, we could go on all day about human rights violations in China. Uh, so I don't think you compare the Chinese dream, whatever that may be, to the American dream. I really don't. And I was going to say, you know, I'm a, one, one thing is we have, one problem we have right now is the label thing. You're a Republican, so I know everything about you. I'm a Democrat, so you know everything about me. Well, that's not the case, you know. I believe that black lives matter. I stand up for, for African Americans, but I've got a problem with football players that kneel down during the national anthem. I've got a problem with people that disrespect the flag of a country that allows them to make $40 million a year running around with a football. And I think a lot of Americans have that problem. It doesn't mean that we don't respect black people. It doesn't mean that we don't understand it's a problem, there's still a racial problem. It just means that, you know, uh, America is, so, is a great dream and it's something that we should all respect. And our flag is something we should respect, and I believe that. So we're in the middle of the Trump-Russia inquiry, which many people are saying is you know, another Watergate here. You know, a criticism from a lot of people around the world would be that they would say that America is following Putin's dream. I mean, what impact has the Trump-Russia inquiry had on the American dream, or has it had no impact at all? And I mean, Senator, I, you know, we, we discussed about this a little the other week. I mean, is there a concern, legitimately or not, that a, the American dream is for sale? Well, I don't think, again, I, I don't think it, it really deals directly with the American dream. I think it deals with, with, you know, something that we see as a fault in one of our leaders. And we'll have to see where the investigation leads. I've got to tell you that I worked at the Watergate. I was a Democrat, and I don't understand how that ever happened, because if you wanted to know the secrets of the Democratic Party, all you needed to do was go unjam the Xerox machine. You know, we weren't very <laughs> secretive. We weren't, you know, it was, it was a manifestation of a man that was paranoid and, 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 you know, felt like he had to break into a place where you could have called up on the phone and asked what the secrets were, and we probably would have told you. So, uh, again, I think it's, it's uh, yes, if, if the president has colluded with the Russians, we need to know that, and I think that, that uh, if, if that's what's found out at the end of the investigation, I'm sure that the politicians in America will stand up and do the right thing. So I would say that that whole investigation is a wild fantasy. And after, how long has it been? A year and a half, we have zippity squat evidence of anything. But hang on. No, 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 wait, wait. So, it's not finished yet, you know that. It, right, and so <laughs> you can continue the investigation until you can find someone guilty of something, but that doesn't mean that the central, you know, the central problem or the original uh, charge, I mean, it's just like whitewater. You know, if you want to keep investigating President Clinton until, 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 eventually someone's going to do something wrong. That's not what it's about. We just had a case this last week, only a couple of days ago, where uh, the Mueller investigation went in front of a judge, and the judge literally laughed him out of court and said, this has nothing to do with the original charge, the original warrant that Congress gave him for the investigation. So there's nothing there. The most likely outcome of this investigation is, is we will probably uncover corruption in the Obama administration leading up to the, uh, to the election itself. And look, there's already, there's already been there's already been several findings, and the IG report from the FBI I thought was very interesting, and we've seen Andrew McCabe uh, lose his job over it, and he will likely be, uh, in, well, he's being investigated, and he may be indicted. So the, that whole fantasy, in my mind, is so, just, it, it's, it's a waste of time. However, the important thing is, is that if Democrats take control of the House of Representatives, they will impeach Donald Trump, and they will, in, they will impeach him because it's Monday morning and for no other reason. And unfortunately, in, in a political system, that's all they require. They've already preferred uh, papers of uh, impeachment twice on him. So you want to see an end to the inquiry. Would you support a call for the tax returns from Trump then to end it? Because you're saying it's been a year and a half, nothing's found. The tax found, returns, the tax returns from the president have nothing returns. to do with it. 
They have nothing. I to would do. say, look, if you need a reason to impress to to impeach Donald Trump, call me because I could come up with a dozen. But <laughs> but but he's right. It's a political thing. It's not. It's not a legal thing. It is a political thing. You know, uh, Andrew Johnson was impeached because he fired a postal worker. The Constitution says misdemeanors, high crimes and misdemeanors. Well, a parking ticket's a misdemeanor. But, you know, l l l j let's just be honest about this man. He doesn't have a history of being straight up and honest. So I think the investigation needs to be uh, needs to come to a conclusion. You know, this is a man that will tell you that he is a great success one day, and, and, and then the next day you find out that he's not worth a trillion dollars. So the, he's the, only the greatest a service to the nation right now would be, without question, is Robert Mueller finishing the investigation yeah. well, in the next two months true. and saying, I either have evidence or I do not. And if he does not have direct evidence of a crime, of a chargeable crime, end the investigation and move on. The basis of the, the original investigation was uh, the question of Russian involvement in the American election. And the, the truth of the matter is, is that the Russians have been trying to involve themselves in American elections since forever. And there's, there's nothing new or interesting about that. That's something that the, you know, the intelligence agency should probably concern themselves with. How much you know, how much have they involved themselves, and have they been able to penetrate or change the outcomes of elections? And to my knowledge, there's no evidence of that yet. We certainly have ample evidence that Russians and other actors have uh, been able to penetrate uh, the election systems because it's, yeah, it's yeah. kind of a complicated animal, and that we should worry about. Okay, yeah. so you know we're involving all of the world here. Uh, it has great concern over what's going on in the U.S., not just Russia. Right. Uh, someone here in. Uh, Cyprian from Romania said to me the other night, everyone expects from America a new attitude and that a new dream is needed. Uh, another person in our coffee break uh, heard mention of the American dream and said, it's a nightmare. Uh, we're here with 600 world leaders, and many people here in the audience probably want to know, you know, what is the response strategy there? I mean, how do we deal with America going forward? What are the policies you want to bring to the table to make the American dream a reality? What new dreams can America so offer the if world? You, if you want to know where America is going to be going in the near term, uh, President Trump just published uh, a new national security policy. Every president does. He did his a little earlier. Uh, but you can just Google national security policy, or national security strategy, rather, 2017. And it's laid out for you there. There's four basic pillars to it, and it will tell you uh, the basic goals of the national security strategy, as well as regional uh, inferences. So you, you can basically just open it up and read it. It's about 50 pages. And I would say that America will go in the direction that it's always gone. I think we'll, we'll continue to be world leaders. Uh, you know, we're, we're going, we, we have growing pains, and that's one of the wonderful things about uh, our system of government is that it can expand and it can change. And again, I say, look at how much has changed just in my lifetime. How many, you know, when I was a kid, I went to New Orleans with my parents and black people couldn't drink out of the same water fountains that white people could. But now we have a system where women have been accepted and allowed to, to be what they, what their potential allows them to be, and African Americans and other people. Not that there isn't racism in America, not that there isn't sexism in America, but we're growing, and, and what I think the world perceives as a change in course is nothing more than growing pains. I really believe that. Okay, I'd like to open the discussion to the audience for questions. Please, yes, put your hands up and, and you know, get ready here. We have another 10 minutes. To start, I will also begin. Uh, Cyprian had a question. Uh, are you there? Can you, can you stand up? So I, I said to him the other night, uh, and you can explain, I'll just uh, you know, mention the question you had and you can elaborate for, for us. I asked him the other night, you know, we have these senators here, what question would you have for them? And his answer was, will you invest in us? <laughs> can, yes. Which I thought you know, was spot on. Could you explain you know, the importance and the relevance uh, of that question, what that meant? Yes, the relevance of that question starts from the perception that a lot of people have in the Western world that uh, the new policy of America first means only an isolated America. 
as you, Mr. Senator Brown, very well pointed well, out, America is founded by a lot of nations. Mm -hmm. Yes. And this is why a lot of nations, and especially the Western world, expects at least a level of involvement of America as it was in, in the past. Today, the Western world feels that America is going to sleep a little bit. Well, I, I, I don't believe that. I don't think America is going to sleep. First of all, when we have a president that says, make America great again, and when we have a president that says America first, you have to understand that 35% of the American people support this man. 65% of the American people do not support him. We've always been engaged in the world. And, and, you know, again, I think it's growing pains. At the end of the Second World War, the United States economy and military were stronger than the next 10 countries combined. So we're used, we've always been involved, but we're used to telling the world what to do. Now we have to get used to the reality of cooperation. And this is why I'm at Horacis, and I hope this is the reason that you're at Horacis, because we need to come together and solve the world's problem, and you can bet that the American people will be involved. So, Thank okay. you very much. So I would, I would answer it a little bit differently. What I would say is, is that when uh, President Trump talks about American first, he is not saying America only, and he is not saying America withdraw. And if you were to look at the national security strategy, you would see that the, the whole strategy is a strategy of engagement, and that it's not a zero-sum game. We can all do much more together, uh, but a key part of it is, is that you know, he believes that in the past we have not necessarily uh, negotiated the best deals in the best interest of the United States, and that we've traded things away. And that's just, that's a perspective. But no, I, American engagement is absolutely critical. The world is safer and the world is more prosperous when America is engaged and, and we're out there and present. And I believe that we are and I believe that we will be. Thank you very much. And it, you know, it's an easy thing to say politically. You know, let me use my grandmother as an example. My grandmother thought that I could do no wrong. Now, she wasn't objective. She wasn't, you know, she didn't care how you felt, but there's a certain security in that. And when you say to Americans, America first, they go, yeah, America first, why not? Let's be first. But the spirit of America, that doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, give you insight into the spirit of America because Americans give more to the world than anybody, any other society, not our government. There's governments that give more money in charity. But in terms of charitable contributions, Americans give more money per capita than anybody in the world. We have a question up here, and I'm only seeing hands from men. Uh, women, uh, raise your hands. We want to give women Ishiti. a chance here too. I'm sorry, sir, you're, you're not your question. We actually had someone up here the, with the pink shirt. I got the microphone first. I beg your pardon? Yeah, he had the microphone first. He had the microphone first. Okay, we, we, have a, we have a question up here, but, but women, I want... Okay, we have you there at the back. Thank you. Women, stand up, speak up. Okay, yes, please. Thank you. Um, Senator Brown, thank you very much. You, you talked about the American dream. I also wanted to say there's something called the Rwandan spirit. So I also have a bit of a background like you coming after the genocide and being a success for myself in business, in academics, and actually teaching the U.S. Um, my question is... Um, how has America managed to remain true to your constitution, which in the part of the continent where I come from, we've not really succeeded in, main, in being true to our constitutions. We have very beautiful constitutions, but we are not being true to our constitutions. How have you, the American people, managed to remain true to your constitution? Thank you. Well, I think we agree on a, on a basic set of principles. Again, I think we agree on freedom and equality and justice, and we may have a different opinion on how to get there, but I think there's a basic thing. And, and I gotta be honest with you, I think that it's not as prevalent as it used to be. When I was younger, we, there was a thing called being an American, you know, and I think we all agreed about the basic principles. Now there's more discussion about what those, you know, what those principles mean that we didn't have when, when we're younger. But I think we have a basic 
agreement. And this is an amazing thing to me because we are not a homogeneous society. We are made up of people all over the world, but we've come together in this agreement around the American dream, I think. And I think that's, what, that, that's, that's how we stay true to, to, to who we are. So staying true to the Constitution and to the basic yeah. constitutional values that make America uh, you know, what it has been and the, the great nation that it is, uh, is, it's complicated and it's very hard because the, you know, the, the federal legislature as well as every state legislature and even municipalities are constantly uh, creating and writing new laws and very frequently they come into conflict with those constitutional values. And they can do it in small ways, in incremental ways. And that's how we, we can lose our freedom and how we can get away from it a step at a time. But our check and balance for that are the courts. So, uh, for example, Senator Brown and let's say his colleagues in the federal government pass a law that infringes very slightly on my constitutional rights. I may take it to court and then get a Supreme Court judgment to eliminate that law and restore my rights. That's, that's part of the check and balance system. Or uh, we may at the state level pass something that's in contradiction to uh, the federal law and the feds can uh, pass a law to, uh, to correct us and, and uh, supersede it. So there's, there's a, a lot of checks and balances in the system. But the, the trick is, is that everyone has to be aware of what their rights are and then go out and actively defend it and spend a lot of time poking politicians in the chest and yelling at us. And, and um, let me also say that it's not perfect. I hate to agree with, with Senator Waugh again, but, <laughs> but it's, it's not so perfect. Much I'm, not. Disenfran yeah. I'm disenfranchised by the Constitution. The Constitution, Article 1, Section 8 says that Congress shall have control over the, the 700,000 people that I represent, and what I say should not m matter at all to them. So the Constitution is not necessarily my friend, but we still stand up because it's a framework that makes America work. Ma'am, you have a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm a big believer in the American dream. My family's a product of it. Um, when I, I was in university, I learned that people in the prison system, and there are 2.3 million in America, um, struggle to find employment post-release. In some cases, in, in many states, they're not allowed to vote anymore. And the more I learned about the injustices of, of um, post-release um, and the American incarceration system, the more I learned about systemic structural racism and inequality in America. And you, that, we need your questions, ma'am. That means that um, the American dream is not available to everybody. So my question is, what are your views on, on that statement? Do you believe that the American dream is available to everybody? And what are you doing to ensure that it is? So uh, actually, we've, we've had a lot of... No, it's, it, it's a great question. So we've had a, we've had a number of bills on that topic uh, in the state of Maryland. It's a major concern for a number of my colleagues. And I've tried to join with them and, and uh, help that process along. But one of the interesting things that I learned is that actually felons do uh, have their voting rights restored. And so the only question is, is at what point in time? And uh, in, in the case of Maryland now, we've actually started registering felons to vote when they're paroled. Uh, okay. There's some discussion, and I expect that we'll start having felons voting from jail, which will be interesting. The, the, the real underlying question, though, that it comes back to is, is the systemic racism and the biases that have been built into the system over, you know, 100 years. Those are extremely difficult to wring out, and we, and we deal with that literally every day in the legislature on every bill. It comes up constantly. Uh, so it's, it, it's, it's tough, and it's uh, a, just continuing work. There's no way to, there, there's no time that you're going to be able to point to it and say it's done and we can walk away. And, and let we, me just say in Washington, D.C., so we'll have to fe wrap up. convicted felons who have served their time can vote. We are very sensitive to being disenfranchised. So we don't disenfranchise uh, felons who have served their time. They can vote as soon as they've served their time. And, you know, there's a difference between uh, social justice and the framework for justice. So we, you know, as I said in the beginning, in order to form a more perfect union is an admission that our union will never be perfect. And all we can do is strive to make it more perfect. And in Washington, D.C., if you're a felon, you can vote. We have if a gentleman here who's been waiting so patiently. Yeah. It's, any, it's just past six. We need you to make it very any brief, nation everyone. Any that expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization expects what never was and never will be. So you started with Thomas Jefferson. I had to go back to Thomas Your Jefferson. Your question, sir. Yes. You didn't mention who the American dream, the idea, who that came from. James Trunslow Adams. 
fuller, richer, and better for all Americans, 1931. What are you doing to impact the field of higher education? Because as students are coming out of universities now, they're saddled with debt. So what are you doing to impact that so that the American dream is still possible for them? Well, you're talking to a guy that's put two of his children through college and is working on the third one, and, and I'm very sensitive to this. But let me tell you what we do in the District of Columbia. If you go to a state school in the District of Columbia, anywhere in America, we will give you $10,000 a year, up to $10,000 a year in tuition assistance. You never have to pay it back. It's not a loan. It's a gift because we don't have a college system in the District of Columbia because we're not a state. So we're trying to address the problem. And I agree with uh, Elizabeth Warren. You shouldn't be loaning money to banks at one quarter of a percent and charging children 8% to get a damn education. We ought to do by our kids as well as we do for the banks. I agree with that. So, okay, we have to wrap up. We will have a final 15 word 15 second from answer to that is, Senator is that Moore. we have to control the, the, uh, the costs in higher education in order to bring the price down and maintain its affordability for the rest of our, our, our kids. So. Thank you so much, everyone. We have another Thank session so beginning, so unfortunately we are going to move this outside, but I know this conversation will continue. Thank you so much to Thank the senators you. that have joined us. Thank Keep you. dreaming. Thank you so much. Thanks. Keep dreaming. <laughs>